Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we have a really special episode for everybody tonight. We are so excited about this episode, aren't we, Landon? It's a great one. Yes. It's a great one. And we wanted to do a little preview. This is a little different than what we've done before, because this episode, we actually went off site and you'll find out more about that in a minute. But we just wanted to let everybody know how excited we are about our guest, our very special guest, Moshe Quinn, who is the son of D. Michael Quinn. And what we're going to be discussing in this episode is a new memoir um, by D. Michael Quinn. And his son is going to tell us all about it. And this book is just incredible, isn't it, Landon? It is. It's called Chosen Path, and it's put out by Signature Book, and uh, that's one of the reasons we wanted to talk about it, because uh, D. Michael Quinn uh, led an extraordinary life, and there is some very uh, revealing uh, things in this book. Uh, we go over just a few of them uh, at the end of the episode. Uh, first, we, we take the advantage to talk to Moshe about how the book came about uh, and how it got published after... Uh, Michael Quinn's death, but this book is just filled with things that are just make you go, oh my gosh. Um, and we, we aren't able to get to all of them, but we, we wanted to point out that there's a couple of, of those in this episode, and uh, we really encourage you to go out and get the book. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that being said, I think I think this is the teaser, isn't it, Landon? That's it what we created, right? Yep. yep. <laughs> and I haven't gotten through all of the things in there. There's a there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. No. Basically, he was just he was a part of history, and we discussed that in this episode that he really was there for so many pivotal moments um, in Mormonism through the '70s and '80s, and it's just incredible to read about all the people that he talks about and the things that he saw and the things that he knew. These are mind blowing things that are in this book. So again, we can't encourage everybody enough to, to go get it and we'll have information in the episode on how to do that. So that being said, um, we're going to go off site and we're going to be talking to our special guest and another special guest. And we know you're just absolutely going to love it. Thank you, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And you may notice that we are in a different surroundings tonight. This is amazing. We are in the headquarters of Signature Book in Salt Lake City, and there's a very special reason that we are here for this episode. We have two incredible guests with us on Mormonish today. We have the wonderful Barbara Jones Brown, who is the executive director of Signature Book, and we have Moshe Quinn, who is the son of D. Michael Quinn. And the reason we're here today is to talk about a new memoir that has recently come out called Chosen Path, a memoir by D. Michael Quinn. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Barbara, for letting us use your beautiful facility. This is incredible, isn't it, Landon? It's great. Yeah. yeah. No, we've had a lot of fun. We've kind of been perusing the stacks. We've been <laughs> gathering up books. We almost didn't get around to podcasting because we were having so much fun here. But no, we're definitely here for a reason. So this book, Chosen Path, a memoir, um, just came out and we'll give you some details at the end of the podcast on how you can get your own copy. But Landon and I have been reading this. We've been lucky enough. Barbara gave us um, a, sort of a first copy. We've been reading through this and we cannot put it down, can we? I, I was blown away. <laughs> this book, if you, you've got to go out and get this book. It's, it's got it's not your standard church book. No. It's got sex. It's got drugs. It's got <laughs> rock and roll. It's got political intrigue. It's got church intrigue. It, I, w I couldn't put it down. I was just going, oh my gosh, this is an incredible book. Uh, so yeah, definitely you want to get a copy of this. Well, with that endorsement, Landon, I don't even know how we can follow that up. That's <laughs> No, we definitely wanted to talk um, today about the process through which this book even came to be. And I thought we'd sort of start by having Barbara just maybe tell us a little bit about the public persona of D. Michael Quinn. For our viewers and listeners who may not, you may have heard of the legendary D. Michael Quinn, but you may not know exactly who he is. So maybe Barbara, you could just talk a little bit about that. Sure. So D. Michael Quinn was a noted historian of Mormon history, and he, it was his passion. He spent his life researching and writing about it from the time that he was a teenager. Um, he received his undergraduate degree at Brigham Young University in history, his master's degree at the University of Utah, and then his PhD at Yale University. So he had quite an education, educational background in this field. 
One of his mentors was the Leonard J. Arrington, who was a former church historian for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And he was there, he was born in 1944, so he was there in the 1970s, in the 1980s, when something called the New Mormon History was emerging. And what that was, was the professional telling of Mormon history, rather than before um, it was just told by church leaders, and it was only a glorification, uh, glorified telling of church history. Mm -hmm. And Mike was a professional historian, as was his mentor, Leonard J. Arrington, and many others in the history department at that time for the church. And they were professionally trained historians that were using professional methods to tell history. So some of the church's history that before had not been brought to light or uh, was maybe just only glass, glossed over, Mike delved into it and told it like it was. And so you have here some of his uh, books that he published. So the Mormon Hierarchy series were uh, some of his first books. He, he also wrote Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview yeah. for which he wore, won the Mormon History Association's Best Book Award in 1988. <laughs> he also wrote a biography of J. Reuben Clark. So these are just some of his works, and he published many, many articles, scholarly articles as well. So he is looked up to by Mormon historians today, historians of Mormonism today. He was also one of the September 6th. He was excommunicated in September 1993, partly be because of his um, hard-hitting <laughs> look at Mormon history. And then he was critical of church leaders who weren't willing to to talk about the nitty gritty, if you will. Right. And so those things eventually got him in the crosshairs of church leaders and led to his excommunication. So, but anyways, he's a person that I admired and looked up to my whole life. I had the opportunity to meet him a few times. I was lucky enough to meet him. Very kind person. I didn't get to know him very well. I wish I had, but I feel like I've gotten to know him well through his telling of his own life through this remarkable memoir. Yeah. So. And I think that's what we should let everybody know is that this is, it's not a biography. This is an autobiography. This is written by D. Michael Quinn. And there's, there's such an interesting process, how this even came to be. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that, Marcia? I mean, just fascinating. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to, to sum it up well. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it was a, a long story with him. I mean, our father was working on his uh, versions of his memoirs or his autobiography. Um, it's, it's not an autobiography, but writing about his life for uh, for decades. Um, he started in his early twenties, mm -hmm. really, um, in a in a concerted fashion. Um, I myself was only really aware of one version of this that he shared with us when I was uh, twelve years old. So this is the late eighties, and at that time he had a like a forty something page version of what I think he called his autobiography. Um, and so he mailed it to us. We were not living at the time together. This is after the divorce. And so he mailed us all a copy. And I believe I read I read all 40 something pages at that time <laughs> as a 12 year old. Um, and that was the only version of it that I was aware of um, really at the time of his death. But that's really like my, my subjective point of view. Um, our sister Mary was fairly familiar with uh, some version of his memoirs that's similar to what we have published today um, that was um, completed by 2010. And he shared a copy of this with her. Um, he got feedback from her a little bit. She didn't read the entire thing, but she read some parts of it and they discussed it. Um, he sent CD-ROMs, uh, when people were sending CD-ROMs, uh, also to myself and to my sister Lisa, and maybe also to our, our mother. Um, but I, you know, living life and he yeah. sent me things and I actually just recently I was I was uh, moving and going through some boxes and I, I found this CD-ROM um, in storage. It was it was oh in a box um, and it just wasn't really on my radar because I didn't really note it too much when it yeah. arrived and then I just forgot that it uh, was in storage. Right. Um, so it was on our sister Mary's radar. But after he passed away, um, I I, um, I had some inquiries uh, that came to me um, about his memoirs. And I was like, oh well, I mean, do you mean like this autobiography thing that mm -hmm. he wrote uh, in the late eighties? It was like, well. No, no, I, I mean, we're, we're aware, I mean, we, there were a few people that made these inquiries. <laughs> people were aware of some version of those memoirs um, that were much more recent than the late 80s, which, like I said, it's similar to, to what we have here, um, ready to, um, in 2010. Um, so I was unaware of that myself, um, and we were, you know, in the middle of things, you know, with his passing. It was not um, a front burner thing for us at the time. 
Um, but he had, he had this laptop and we knew that anything that, that was of, of concern and of, um, of importance would be on his laptop. Um, so it was some time for us to, to get it and then to go through it and, and everything was word perfect based on oh. his laptop. <laughs> oh my gosh, so CD-ROMs, it was perfect. Really, really yeah, are. I tried to open these files, you couldn't even see the file names. Like, like the file names were just like Got random me. random letters and numbers. Um, so we had to, to you know sift through with a comb in a sense to, to um, identify like which, which files were actually relevant for his memoir project. And then once we did so, we had to find a conversion process to get from WordPerfect to something that we could actually wow. read. Wow. And so it was a little, a little while. It was yeah. a few, several months before we finally um, had versions of, um, of uh, the, the chapters or the content um, to look through and then to, to think about like what we would do with this. Um, and it wasn't too long um, before we contacted Signature Books, you know, Gary Berger at Signature, just before he retired. Um, oh, okay. And uh, talked with him about it. And um, we actually had been in touch with uh, Clifton Jolly, who is uh, an old, old friend of our mm-hmm. father's. Yep. Um, a man that we kind of grew up with as a, a friend of the family, his family and our family. We just lived like a block away from each other for several years in the avenues and you know being oh, um, being a colorful writer uh and also <laughs> a very dear and old friend of our father's we thought oh well maybe maybe we can like give this to clifton to see if maybe clifton would be interested in doing something with it um and we had a, a few conversations with him about that just to sort of see what might happen so we just floated that by him he was interested but then it was it's a big project <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it didn't seem didn't seem really practical for like whatever that might be like a thing to sort of like right. proceed from there and and um, yeah it just made more sense for us to to test space with signature which um is an, uh, an old home of his you know in publishing yeah they published a lot of his work yeah we published all of all of his books besides one and, and you were aware of this memoir because he had turned it in to you previously so oh, i i started with signature in march of 2022 so less than a year after your dad passed and Gary Bergera who who uh, Moshe had mentioned he brought it to me I replaced Gary Bergera when he retired this was the first manuscript I got when I started with signature and Gary brought it to me and I said what D. Michael Quinn wrote a memoir are you kidding me and so Gary gave me the hard copy of course I snatched it up and took it home and I just couldn't stop reading it because um, I was just so fascinated by his story. Yeah. Um, and as I was reading it, I thought, I, I don't think we should just publish it as is. I think it needs to be annotated. Mm-hmm. In other words, I think it needs to have, you know, footnotes at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And we know D. Michael Quinn loved footnotes. Yes, he did. But he's never read this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so footnotes at the bottom. So for people who aren't as familiar with Mormon history, for right. example, or people who were younger, who yes. may will not remember many of these mm-hmm. events, and names and so forth. People can read it and all of that is explained for readers at the bottom. So the process of annotating this took quite some time. It took well over a year to do a good job on it. We had a team of annotators uh, who knew, either knew Michael Quinn personally or knew his work. Um, I'll just mention that by name, Connell yeah. Donovan, Calvin Burke and Sue Bergen and myself annotated it. Um, and then we also edited, you know, just for style and so forth. Um, and finally, we have it ready to share with the world yeah. now. He had actually, Mike Quinn had turned in a manuscript of this memoir to Signature in 1998. And at that time, i have seen that version. And the reviewer said, this is great. We want your memoir, but you really need to fill it out. There wasn't a lot about his emotions or his feelings and that kind of thing. It was just more matter of fact kind of marching okay. through. Statements. So they asked him to fill in more, which he did. But for some reason, he never turned it back to Signature oh. to publish, which we would have if we'd gotten it from him. But we're just glad we got it from Moshe and, and yeah. Moshe's sisters. Yeah, and that's a, it, it's a great story uh, of how this came about. You know, after his passing, all of a sudden this book appears yeah, of his memoirs. And it's not yeah. a narrative. It, it's not an autobiography like you would think that right. it's just going to walk you through his life. It's it's actual pieces out of, out of history, out of mm-hmm. church history. Mm-hmm. He's really part of the history. He's yeah. not just a historian, mm-hmm. but he's involved. He's hearing the decisions and he's talking about it. He's writing it in his journal and you can just go and find so many different things. And obviously one of the things in here that's, that's so important, you can't, you can't talk about D. Michael Quinn without talking about his sexuality um, because uh, he, he was gay 
and that was part of the I don't know if that was part of the excommunication, uh, if if they knew that at the time. It, certainly it was, was known that he was gay. He had come right. out, but he, he himself said he was not excommunicated for being gay, is what he said. Right. Yeah, my understanding, <laughs> uh, and you know, I stand to be corrected, but my from my memory, he hadn't come out publicly um, when he was excommunicated. He came out publicly with the publication of Same Sex Dynamics, The Mormon okay, Example, Mexican so American Americans, The Mormon Example, okay. which was like a year after. Maybe yeah. I'm wrong Maybe there. Maybe more, right, more publicly. Well, like there were friends, some people in the community who yeah, knew. Yeah, like but, Leonard but, Eric, he, yeah, yeah Leonard, right. when he moved back to Salt Lake City, friends and, friends he and leaves, intimates. yeah, and then he has this party, mm -hmm. and he hangs all of his photography of mm -hmm. men mm -hmm. on the wall, and he invites all of his close friends, like Leonard Erickson and so forth, and it's kind of his coming out party. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Friends. For, for friends. <laughs> and, and he was yeah. not shy about it in, no. in his memoirs here. No, he's uh, proud of it. He's Ariel proud of it. And that was one identity. of the questions I had for you because there's some pretty graphic, uh, you know, things that he describes in here. You know, some of the experiences he had as a young man growing up mm -hmm. that led to it, some of his later experiences. And you had to kind of go through there and, and, and put, you know, put that in there. I, I guess it's already in there, but to, to put that out to a Mormon audience mm -hmm. has got to be a little tough uh, for, for the editor. Did you have any pushback or? Well, yeah, Motion, I talked about this. And um, if Mike wanted it in, it needed to stay That's in. Right. These are his words. It's his life. And yep. so what we decided to do, because there was one incident of assault that he mm -hmm. describes mm -hmm. as a young man. Yep. So what we decided to do is just give a content advisory for readers who may mm -hmm. have a hard time with assault and so forth. Just said, hey, in chapters three, three and four, he discuss, discusses sexual acts mm -hmm. and including one incident of assault. And then readers can decide for themselves if they want to mm -hmm. skip three and four. Yep. If that's a trigger for them, great. But if they don't want to, it's all there. Mike wanted it in, so yep. it's there. Did you want to add anything to that motion? Um, yeah, not much really, but... It, it is something just like on a personal level when I'm reading, it is, it is intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. Sure yeah. That. Like this yeah. is, this is some it's intense awakening content. Sexuality. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's been interesting, you know, as a son and especially like without him being here anymore, mm -hmm. like it, it would be, I mean, of course, with everything that I, I read here it would be nice if he were here so I could actually discuss <laughs> a lot of these things yes. with him. Um, so there's a, a certain kind of surreal or, or odd quality in having such incredible intimate um, truth telling mm -hmm. and, and revelation mm -hmm. for me things that I, I was not aware of very very personal matters that that he didn't share um, and you know have that have that space of like non-conversation yeah. yeah basically or that fact of, of uh, yeah. you know inaccessibility to to process with yeah. him or to like yeah. share yeah. with yeah. him because I'd love to be able to do that of yeah. course and I that's what I, I said had then. a lot of conversations and one of the things I said to Mo shows I have never edited a dead author before. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so typically yeah. I've edited a lot a lot of authors' works, but I there's back and forth with them. So right. instead we had those conversations together saying, Well, what what would your dad want? Right. And that kind oh, of that's, Well that's what really so came out in the book was his struggle between his sexuality and his Mormonism yeah. because he held his Mormonism yes. that you could tell it was very important to him. Yeah. Uh it, it it kind of acted as his as his pseudo parent i guess as he was growing up he mm -hmm. said a lot of the, the, mm -hmm. the people who raised him were were the people that he looked up to were were strong mormons so that mormonism was a was a strong part of him but his sexuality also was was always there in, in the background uh that he struggled with and so it's a it's an intense amazing story yeah. about that and uh in the foreword you you kind of talk about why they named it the uh, chosen path mm -hmm. and uh i don't know uh uh, if you'd like to read uh, that section, you actually wrote, uh, uh, Marsha, the, yeah, the, we should definitely mention the forward. That, yes. uh, if you'd like to read Beautiful. kind of uh, that section we talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. When a writer's life ends, it should be no surprise when new interest emerges for what he wrote of that life. We like our stories to be complete. A life means something new when the story gets an ending. But meaning is never so complete or final. The repeated revisions and self-doubts that occupied his attention for more than half a century suggest the scope, depth, and duration of his struggle with meaning. How to make sense of his life. How to account for himself. And that seemed to be what the book was about, yeah. was his accounting for who he was yeah. and, and the stories of his life that, uh, that impacted him. Um, there's another, uh, I think, Barbara, you wrote the foreword, right? Um, 
Most of wrote the forward. I wrote the publisher. The publisher's the publisher. introduction, yeah. And, John, and, and one of our um, editors, John Hatch, too. We, yeah. we collaborated. Yeah, this was really impactful in, in this. If you could read that one, uh, the section there. Uh, it, I read this and I was just like, wow, this is yeah. this is powerful. Yeah, so it's a, I mean, to give this context, it's, it's a quote from one of his early uh, journal entries, right? As I recall. Well, anyways, it's a quote. <laughs> that may not be the exact context. Yeah, it's but from, it's, it's, it's from a quote the from his, from uh, yeah, from yeah, the book itself. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I also realized that I saw the LDS church in my own situation, outwardly happy and prospering, but burdened with unspoken secrets and wounds that needed to be opened for the process of healing and health. Guess I hope to obtain some vicarious comfort by bringing a resolution for the Mormon experience that I couldn't give to my own life. Yeah, I was just yeah. like, wow. Yeah. He saw the church, he saw his own life in the church and yeah, it struggled true. with trying to figure out how it was gonna deal with its history. He had the same issue trying to figure out how he could deal with his sexuality within the, the context that he was with. So uh, it, was, it was very powerful from that sense. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about your dad? I mean, yeah. it was very personal and, and obviously, uh, you know, he was married, uh, he married your mother, uh, had a life together, had four kids, I think, yeah. four mm -hmm. kids yeah. uh, mm -hmm. together. And so it talks about that, but he he was gay from, from the start and that caused a lot of problems in the marriage. Uh, I think your mother knew about it. You want to talk a little bit about how your family dynamic and, and how you handled that yeah um yeah, and again this this is very much just from my own mm. subjective Correct. point of view I, yeah. I couldn't speak from my mom's point of view certainly which would be radically different from mine um so i'm the youngest of the four kids and there's an eight year span um uh, across uh, across the four of us um i was born in 76 um his last child and they divorced when i was eight years old and so he he was out of the house um from that time and 86 or so, 80, 85. Um, and so I do, we do have memories. And I, I remember sharing this with my siblings as well. Memories of him mainly being present with us on weekends. Um, he, we were living in the avenues in Salt Lake City. And so he was commuting to BYU uh, to teach. Um, and then also he was in the stacks. He was doing research. He was, um, he was busy with things, you know, when he wasn't done teaching his classes. And, and so he was uh, gone early in the morning and then he would um, come back late at night um, on weekdays. And so he was kind of like a week a weekend father from, from our perspective. Mm -hmm. And again, this is me from zero sure. up until the eight, age of eight. Right, as a child. So yeah. I'm not sure how, how my, my oldest sister, for example, would um, you know, remember these things as well. But, but he was uh, a weekend father and you know, very warm. We would watch uh, Saturday morning cartoons <laughs> as a regular ritual. I remember like waking up with my brother, Adam, and we shared a bedroom at that time. And, and it was just this exciting thing for us to crawl into our parents' bed where they had the, the TV um, in their bedroom, <laughs> crawl into their bed at uh, seven in the morning, or yeah. I think seven in the morning was like sort of the, the first cartoon, <laughs> cartoon. Yep. that would start <laughs> Saturday. And it would be, I, I guess, a couple of hours. Um, I forget, but it seems like there's probably a couple of hours of like one show after the other that was- And he um, would watch with you? Yeah, yeah. See, I mean, maybe he so would go cute. to the bathroom so or like take a shower or something, but, <laughs> he, but he was there for a lot of it. And he does describe that at one point in his book. Oh, uh, when so when he first gets to Yale, he describes watching cartoons with your two sisters. <laughs> All these sisters. Yeah, and so that, that carried through That's when they came dad. back to Salt Lake. That's and great. Yeah, so there, there was the, the, the ritual of Saturday morning uh, cartoons. And then we would have, you know, Saturday evening, like movie time. The movies were a big part of his life, even as a young boy, and that carried into um, our family upbringing. And then, yeah, then Sunday church, and then our, our Sunday dinner um, um, as a family together. Um, but he, he, he was absent a good deal of the time as yeah. the, the, the breadwinner, you know, the traditional model. Um, but also he was, he was out of the household, I think, for, you know, dealing with his struggle. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just slammed on the uh, table. <laughs> One thing we should Our mics are sensitive. We told everybody, don't hit the table. Exactly. No, this is um, a hitting the table kind of book in some cases. So we so, got to do it. So this is, this may or may not be what he would see himself or agree to himself. But this is um, our impression as, as children is that, that he was, he was absent and it seemed to us maybe excessively absent and in our interpretation especially when we found out that he was gay and mm -hmm. i didn't know that when i was a boy right. um he came out to my brother and and myself um when i was 10 yeah. and my brother was 12 and, that's and we were about book. to move to montana yeah. Yeah. um so yeah so we didn't know his inner struggle um 
but we knew that he wasn't really around that much. And it was more in hindsight. It's like, yeah, actually, maybe dad wasn't really around that much. And mm -hmm. sure, he's busy researching, you know, he's writing books, he, he's ambitious with his career. Um, but we had this sense as teenagers, after he came out to us, like reflecting on those um, early days, that probably there was some element of escapism. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure and, so. and the fact of his, not just like being away from home, but maybe even his, um, his, uh, his deep focus in his research and his career as well had an element perhaps of escapism. Mm -hmm. That may or may not be fair, but that was certainly this picture that we held, mm -hmm. um, all, I think all four of us, maybe even my mother a little bit, but like certainly us children have had that picture as teenagers. Um, and when, you're, when your parents divorced, um, he talks about the struggle uh, between, you know, your mom knew and, and she's trying to deal with that. And the, it sounded like they worked very well trying to, trying to make sure everyone was taken care of. How did that impact you or your family? How, how do you remember that? Well, you know, there's a lot that you don't really see, then a lot that you do see, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. comprehend and don't comprehend, yeah. you know, when you're a child. So it's it's hard to, to say, um, especially just being very young, the youngest of, mm -hmm. of all four of us. Um, there was a general feeling that I, I remember and carry of um, closeness and comfort and mutual support um, that was certainly there between our parents, you know, very loving relationship. And there were also plenty of memories of, uh, you know, strife and, you know, arguments yeah. and, you know, yelling, you know, yelling matches, not matches, but, you know, just sort of yeah. yelling yeah. spats that Dynamics. that were scary yeah. and that were yeah. freaky for yeah. us. Yeah. I don't know if that's a lot different than a lot of families. Right. Um, <laughs> Sounds typical. So, yeah. So, like, you know, as a zero to eight year old, you know, there was this, this closeness and this comfort um, and also there was tension um, that I was aware of. And, um, you know, a lot of it just didn't like really make sense. I think about this a lot, of course, you know, as an adult, like to what degree, you know, was that tension really driven and informed mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. a deeply unhappy marriage or an unsatisfying marriage yeah, um, on both sides? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And certainly yeah. like I see like, okay, yeah, there certainly a lot of the strife was certainly at that. And, and there was a lot of tension that kind of like spread and affected all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, unhappiness and struggle, you know, that were affecting all of us, um, that I'm, I have, you know, more of an adult perspective, you know, like looking back on it. Um, but, you know, in the middle of it at that time, I mean, just, you're just living a life and this yep. is your family and yeah. you have happy times and time you have, <laughs> and you have tough times and yeah. Yeah, I just wasn't really comprehending, you know, so much. Well, it came out in the book because he wasn't only hiding it from from the, the family, right. but he had to hide it from obviously his career. He's yes. teaching at BYU, Employer. he's a church historian, yeah. he's working with the brethren, he's working with church historians. Yeah. He can't let that out. And and you could just tell that you could feel the struggle <laughs> in his memoirs of of that pulling against him. Yeah. Um, well, it, it seems unbearable to me. Yes. Yeah. Just, I, I really can't imagine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, he was trying to yeah, function in a certain era, right? A certain place yeah, in history and that then, made it so difficult yeah and this comes out in the memoir as well and again this is where one way in which mike quinn is a historical figure not just a historian of world yes. history he lived in an era when church leaders said uh homosexuality is it's just mm -hmm. a it's a struggle you're having it's mm -hmm. a it's a weakness of the flesh mm -hmm. you can overcome it through fasting and praying and if you just do that and, and do everything you can and go on a mission and marry a woman in the temple mm -hmm. and have a lot of kids it will go away yeah. and and that was the belief at the time and mike grasped onto that belief because of his identity mm -hmm. as a faithful devout mormon he believed that and he sought to do that but through the years being married to your mom and being in a mixed orientation marriage they finally came to the realization both of them like this it's not going to go we can't make this work in spite of our love for each other and our love for our children, it's not working and this is a fallacy. And of course now church leaders don't say, go out and you can overcome this and it'll go away. They say it is something people are born this way, right? right. And acknowledge that and they don't encourage mixed orientation marriages anymore. Um, and so it's a different era. So for people who wanna understand what it was like to be a devout gay person or um, LGBTQ person in this era, they can understand it through Mike's experience and Mike's words.
Yeah, that's very powerful part of the book. I mean, it informs the entire thing and it's all the way through. And, and like you say, it's hard, I think, for younger people to understand that because we're all of a certain age where I think we we understand that that was the culture. I mean, I personally had a, a roommate who ended up in a mixed orientation marriage without knowing anything of about yeah. it, you know, and, and you find that out years later and you're just like, what happened? How did this happen? Yeah. But that was what you that's were told to do, you know, and just the collateral damage of that, I think, is just, I think people are still processing that. So uh, what yeah, was Mike, your, I have to add that, yeah. Mike was so grateful he had the four beautiful that, children he had. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, and and that's that comes the out positive. as well yep. as like, I still, he wouldn't have yep. treated the family. Nope, and that's that he the was upside. He, he wished he could have spared Jan, his, yeah. his wife, yeah. or just yeah. the pain, but he was still so grateful yeah. to have the beautiful family he did. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, changing. he was uh, he was a very loving father. I mean, yeah, yeah. despite I'm what sure I said so. about, you know, there was a degree of absenteeism or escapism, yeah. you know, when I was a kid. Um, there was never a doubt in, in it, well, in my mind, I don't think in any of our minds, really, that um, that he loved us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I always saw him as a very deeply loving father, and he was very um, demonstrative of his affections and Aww, his love. That's so sweet. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, I feel really bad for him. Yeah. Well, you're denying yeah. himself. No, <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't. So yeah, sure. I mean, I, my siblings, you know, resulted from his, uh, you know, denial. But I was like, I, you know, I, I don't feel great about his, his struggle. You know, no, or, not or at all. And I'm not. sure, as an adult, yeah. you, as an adult, you started to understand it more and more. What was your relationship like with him as an adult? I mean, you talk about cartoons as a kid. What, what was he like as a, as a, as a father of an adult? Yeah. Well, the thing, yeah, the thing that always comes to the fore for me thinking about that is, is. Uh, what came into great focus at his passing, but it was also very much in my mind before he passed. Like when I think about my father in my life and, and what he was for me, especially as an adult, he um, he was he was always the best listener that I ever had. And I've had a lot of good listeners in my life, um, but he uh, he he was the best in my life. Overall, my mom's a great listener too. I mean, she's very careful. Look at the camera and tell us. Like your mother's also amazing. No, she is. She is a very great listener. But there was just a way that my father. There was a certain way that my father listened to me, and also just like my personality and his personality being right. being part of that picture. Um, but he was just a good listener, Aww. and and I just knew that like if there was a certain thing that I had going on, a struggle of mine, um, something I was like trying to work out, or if I just needed to vent. There was a certain quality to his listening that just um, helped me a great deal in those moments. Um, and I've heard this from other people as well, you know, people like reflecting on um, him being a, a great listener and just very present. Um, and he just, um, he, he was very supportive, a very supportive uh, parent um, in that way. Well, he, he lived an incredible life. You can't, you can't read he this and not say, I mean, he was yeah. a, he was a military counterintelligence officer in in uh, Germany, Germany, in Germany, and he's yeah. out there uh, looking for bugs in, in the offices and different things. The stories you, you, that that's where there's kind of that international intrigue because he's mm -hmm. got that piece of him. Uh, but then also, it you're, you're getting such an inside view of what's happening in the church mm -hmm. and during the church history and. I actually listed a couple of the things here. I wanted to go through some of the book and talk about some of those. There's, there's so many of them, and they're just so rich, and you read those. Uh, one, the, the first one was uh, Dr. Clandestine, and uh, we, we've been uh, we've done a podcast done kind a podcast of about that, that and right. we, we came to Signature's book to, to see Sandra Tanner with uh, Lighthouse. Lighthouse. Yeah, Anyone who hasn't read Lighthouse. Sandra, Gary Bergero, oh. and I did a Mormon okay. Stories episode about Dr. Yep. Clandestine, if people want to watch that. Right. And, and so we get the other side of that kind of, because we got Sandra's story about the pamphlet that was written in, yep. in response to their... Uh, to their book, Shadow and Reality, Mormonism, Shadow and Reality. Uh, the one that you see in uh, in the movie Under the Banner, Under of, the Heaven, Banner the of Heaven, yeah, book, the big red right? book. Yeah. Uh, and so the, uh, some of the historians felt that there needed to be a response to that, and uh, your dad got nominated, I guess, <laughs> somehow. He, he, he came up and he was the guy to write the response, but they yeah. wanted it to be anonymous. Yeah. And so he wrote he wrote it anonymously, and he we we actually got one of these. It's it's yeah, uh, something that we're trying to this keep. Is this is an actual, actual one. one. That's right. And they published this, and it, 
the Quinn, tanner, wait, Michael Quinn published it. My, yeah. Michael Quinn yeah, published on his it. Own that's right, on his own. Yes. And that's why he kept it anonymous. And that's right. He kept it very anonymous. he wasn't it, supposed to publish it. <laughs> that's right. And, and it ends up at Sam Weller's bookstore with yeah, all these. It he puts yep. it in a warehouse and says, there's some there's some That's pamphlets. Right. Go pick these up. That's right. And in left a trench this coat. Message. A in a trench, trench coat. coat, right? <laughs> kind of in an alley somewhere. But yeah, it needed to get the information out yeah. to sort of dispel what was said in Sandra and Gerald's book. So and so, no one really knew who it was. He always right. denied that it was him. But in yeah. his memoirs, uh, you can actually read yeah. about that. Um, uh, I know I looked at this on page three fifty two in, in the book. He kind of talks about that and he. Leonard Arrington knew that he was the the writer of it, and he he'd always felt it sounded like he felt very um, guilty that Leonard Arrington had to kind of say no, I don't know anything about yeah, this, and, and, and make make some of the denials on that. So uh, that that was just one of the interesting yeah. stories, and you can see yeah that they've actually got a picture, picture of the of the pamphlet in here, and that whole story is told on there, and because we only have a, a limited amount of time. I don't want to read all of these, no, but uh, there's, there's so many, there's so many other stories in here, like Leonard Arrington. Uh, he was yeah. with Leonard Arrington or he called L Leonard Arrington uh, just after uh, he was released as the uh, church historian. And anyone who knows that story, uh, yeah. he was a true historian. That was a church historian, Leonard Arrington, uh, Leonard Arrington. And Barbara, yes. you might be able to tell that yeah. story a little better, but um, that was in what you said, the new Mormonism, right? Where yeah. new Mormon history, yeah. new Mormon new history. Mormon history. Okay. Yeah. And the, the brethren didn't necessarily like the new <laughs> Mormon history <laughs> and Leonard Arrington kind of got released from his calling, yeah. uh, because he was pushing true history as opposed to maybe the official narrative. Would yeah, that be so, the right? so he was a PhD trained um, scholar and historian. So he was using these professional methods to tell uh, church history, Mormon history for the first time, he and his department, one of whom was D. Michael Quinn was, was working there. Right. And so it was just Leonard and Michael were ahead of their time. So this was back in the seventies and some church leaders didn't like this new way of professionally telling church history rather than just doing it to build testimony, if you will. Right. And so they um, shut down that department and sent it down to BYU. Yeah, and when, when they released him, uh, he, he he's there. This is from his journal writing about what he talked to him about. And he said... Right. This is from Quinn's journal writing Quinn, about Quinn's what journal. Leonard Arrington said. Exactly. Leonard's response was so typical of him that I could have cried. Yes, he said, and now I am finally relieved of having a title that implied that I had the responsibility of giving the official view of LDS history. Now we can go on with our work without that burden. And I thought, wow, that's yeah. an inside story that he <laughs> he's going, okay, I don't have to tell the official line now. I can actually do the his, yeah. historical work that I'm, as a historian that I'm called to do. And Arrington wasn't afraid to bring out the true history. Right. Uh, he... he he and your dad both thought this needs to come mm -hmm. out as part of it. they thought it could be strengthening as mm -hmm. well as damaging yep. because it told the go right at whole it. story yeah. yeah he was willing to go all at it exactly. so well and i think that that's when we were talking before we even started filming um that michael quinn is a part of history he's not just telling his own story he but he's almost like Forrest Gump <laughs> he was there at every moment it's just incredible and so as we went through the book you can see that we've tabbed it all over because all these things that we've heard about um knew about there he was and he wrote himself in his journal so I wish we had more time to go through every single one but it, it's just amazing this this book is this book is going to be pretty incredible for people to read. I think they're just going to be amazed by what's in here. What else did you find, Landon, that you were really interested in? This one was, was to me the most, as, as I read this, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is almost scandalous. He seemed to have this, the inside scoop on just about everybody. <laughs> he and, was there. And he, he, he wrote <laughs> down about it. Um, so you, you learn about so many people, but uh, this one is one that, that just stunned me as I read it. It's called The Prophet's Kiss, 18 June, 1980. And he says, my last personal contact with Spencer W. Kimball occurred after a banquet in a private room of Brigham Young's Lion House. Its purpose was to honor BYU's recently released president, Dallin H. Oaks, for doing so much to promote the Clark Biography Project. 
As we were leaving, President Kimball shook my wife's hand and gave her a little hug, and I expected just to shake his hand and say goodbye. Then from his journal, he says, then President Kimball began kissing me on the cheek as he talked, saying a few words and kissing me again and caressing my arm and shoulder. I have a special love for you, President Kimball said in that deep, almost whisper voice that is left of his partial uh, larynectomy. And then he continued to kiss me on the cheek and neck as I told him that I was thrilled to be in the presence of the prophet of the Lord. By now he was virtually bathing my cheek and neck in kisses and I put my arm around his shoulder and kissed him on the cheek and told President Kimball that I loved him, after which he kissed me a couple more times on the cheek. I know that there's been, you know, some rumors about the, you know, was President Kimball, did he possibly have any homosexual tendencies? And here he tells that story. And that is a, a very, that's the first time I've ever heard this yeah. uh, story. And I don't book. know, Barbara, you'd said that you'd heard. Well, I think, uh, what does Mike go on to say? Yeah. Um, okay. So said, Mike himself, it is a very interesting passage that I that struck me as well. Um, Mike didn't interpret that as as homosexual expression right. of love himself. Mike mm -hmm. didn't. He he describes it as um, kind of a father's affection, mm -hmm. and he, he after that he determines to be more affectionate as a father. Wow. In, um, in his... That's a nice way to look at it. Yeah, I think that is what he says in the next paragraph. He said, I felt no tears or any emotion, but joy and love that seemed so natural. And for the first time in my life, it seemed the most natural thing in the world to be kissed repeatedly by a man, to have him express his love for me, to tell, to tell him I loved him and to kiss him. It didn't matter that the man was 50 years older than I. So, yeah, it's fatherly love. I love that's, it. that's interesting because you expressed that he was quite affectionate with yeah. you as a father. Well, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it, it reminds me of, I mean, like, for example, going to bed, I'm like maybe six and he's like helping to put me to bed. And one thing that I do really remember is that there was like a little game that, you know, I think fathers do this. They, they have a little bit of like five o'clock shadow or something. Yeah. 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 You were all about kids. And he was just sort of like, ah, you know, sort of rubbing yeah. it on both sides. And we were like freaked out, but also uh, amused and, and uh, you know, pleased at the playfulness. And so that was a, a thing that happened, you know, here and there. But I do also remember kisses on the cheek, loving oh. kisses on the cheek and, and loving kisses on, on the lips as well, occasionally. Oh. Um, that's yeah. yeah. So that's how, how that's he That's beautiful. Did, no, I think that's wonderful. Did Did he ever tell you of the stories of when he met uh, different general authorities yeah. or brethren? Was that anything in your life that you'd... <laughs> I mean, that, that was 1980, right? Uh, yeah, 1980. Yeah. So, so you were four years old. Four years old. And I'd be surprised if he told my, my brother, who would be six at the time. Yeah, this is a good question. Like, if, if my sisters were here, I, I just myself would be surprised... If even my sister Mary, who you know would have been uh, twelve at that time, just as an example, if he was like sharing right. you know these things with her, um, but maybe maybe he did. I mean, I just don't really know because there's enough of an age difference there. Maybe he did relate to her in in very different ways and shared information with her and shared personal experiences with her, very different from me. But yeah. I haven't heard much I'd, of that. I'd love really. to ask your mom about that passage because she witnessed it. Yeah, yeah. that's she right. She, she was, was there. there. I'd love to get her yeah. take on it. Yeah. yeah. So when you were when you were editing Barbara when you were going through things were you I mean I can only imagine as as we start we're reading passage after passage on you know this experience and this person and this, <laughs> yeah, were you having the same kind of experience I can only imagine because as a Mormon historian myself a scholar of Mormon history myself I know most of the people is talking exactly about mm -hmm. and this is insider information fly yeah. on the wall or participant yeah. and you're mm -hmm. i can only imagine that you were just thinking oh my goodness yeah. this is going to be big and it, were there any of his experiences or encounters that that struck you or stuck out to you as far as things uh, that well, he included in the book talking about um the, the the issue of his home his identity mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. as a gay man there was one very sweet passage in there in which she tells the story, Emotion and I talked a lot about this passage, in which she tells the story of a, of a prominent, another prominent uh, historian of Mormonism who is married to a woman and who he'd been friends with for years who comes to him and says, I'm gay. And that person, that individual never came out before he passed away um, so that individual, it hadn't been his choice to publicly mm -hmm. uh, have his name out there. We talked to that individual's wife and she said, 
I don't, it's now my story. My husband mm. has passed. It's now my story and I don't want, that's my private story. So we honored that mm -hmm. and redacted that name. But it was such a sweet and tender, tender passage. It meant so much to Mike. So there's there's all kinds of moments like that that are just really beautiful and uh, insightful. Mm -hmm. That's just one that comes to mind. But there are dozens of experiences like that or things that he shared that I just insights that I had never known before. Yeah, he really seemed to be somebody that people could open up to, that they knew he would be understanding of anything that, that they would say. And yeah. when you hear, like I think of some of the other members of the September 6th that I've had the chance to talk to, and they just love him. I mean, you know, they just adore him. And, yeah. yeah, speaking of September 6th, another um, passage that was so moving. In fact, at Sunstone Symposium this last year, there was, for the 30th anniversary of the September 6th, they had all of the six who were living and wanted to participate were there. And then they asked me to um, read Michael's words as editor of this book of what he might say. And I, so that was a huge responsibility oh for me. I went through and, and just took excerpts from Michael's book and just strung them, put them together. So every word was only his. Oh but as I read it, the, I was emotional. The entire crowd was in tears. But one of the things he said, and I think this speaks a lot to your dad's character, he said, I had a dream in which I saw Elder Boy K. Packer, who is believed to be the apostle behind yes. Mike's excommunication, yes. who yes. did, there was a feud, yes. ongoing feud between yeah. Elder Packer and, and Michael. Um, but he said, I had a dream in which I saw Elder Packer, and we were in the next life, and we embraced and forgiven each other and we were friends and he says i hope that that is true that that's what happened so you know I for, and he said i forgive him and he forgave him um just and that was just part of the excerpts that i read so just a lot of insights like that huh i love that yeah because as we have since come to know boy k packer was kind of that power dynamic <laughs> yeah <laughs> clashing think, with most everyone in the september 6th historians yeah. especially <laughs> yep. uh, with with him and but there, there were a lot of stories where that happened, where he, he would see a clash or he would uh -huh. describe uh -huh. a clash between sometimes him and, and somebody. Uh -huh. Sometimes it was, you know, this, this person came to BYU and gave this speech, which I just can't, you know, can't stand for. or I can't back that up. I, I just can't, can't be yeah. here with that. I, in fact, he called the, oh, what was it that he called the, uh, uh, the Auschwitz uh, or something. Auschwitz of the mind. He called oh, BYU. BYU. Yes. The Auschwitz of the mind. Yes, yes. And, that was, and I think that was Auschwitz. That image was prime in his mind because he had lived in Germany and he wow. and Jan yes. had visited wow. Auschwitz. And so he kind of had that in his mind. So, yeah, he was very. Uh, the, the students loved him. Yeah. Uh, they would always Professor request the him. Year. Yes, they request the him, year. and they yep, wanted him, was. and they had to say, "No, he's got he's got history projects. We've got him on. He can't <laughs> teach all the time." But the students just loved him and, and wanted to go for him, uh, you know, to his classes and, and be uh, have them as, have him as their advisors. Mm -hmm. And that came out here um, after he left BYU, and once uh, he was was in that though, it, it seems like. There's a lot of stories about him separating from the church, or he's in conflict with the church a lot. Um, and I was surprised it was it was almost like he, in in this one I've, uh, from uh, August 1988, he talks about the headquarters trying to track him down. I guess he'd left at this time, and they're trying to track him down to. Uh, I, I I'm not sure at that point. Do you, when was he excommunicated? That would have been September would have been 1993. 93. 93. So yeah. this is this is several years before that. Um, and he says this month the church membership department contacted my mother and lied to her by claiming that they were a Salt Lake City business, which whom I had an unpaid debt. The woman on the phone told my mother to contact her directly through their toll free number as soon as my mother learned my residence address. Mom believed it was a business, but simply forwarded to me the telephone number, which I found was the church memberships department. I doubt that church headquarters told such a lie just so a local ward or state can extend loving fellowship to me, yet that's what they would claim if challenged. Unable to locate me through my mother, LDS headquarters sent church security agents to the home of my personal attorney 
in order to go off record when I moved to California, I'd asked my Salt Lake City ward to transfer my membership record to the ward for his address in Holiday, Utah. One night, two beefy men in white shirts, black suits, and ties knocked at the door of my attorney's home, explaining what they had seen, been, what they had been sent from church headquarters at the request of the membership department. They asked for my current address. When my friend Jim McConkie answered that he was prohibited by attorney-client confidentiality from giving that information, one of the two said, you are a former bishop and nephew of an apostle and you hold a temple recommend. You know that you are wrong. You've taken sacred oaths in the temple and those are more important in your employment as Michael Quinn's attorney. You have a sacred obligation to give us this inf information. My attorney answered, good night, gentlemen, as he closed the door in their faces. So there's this deep desire to go after him and find him uh, that, that you read about and you're just going, oh, wow, this is, this is getting nasty yeah. at, at this point. And, and he talks about that in, in the book. There's several different areas where, you know, he's, he's almost being chased or harassed, and yet he still maintains a belief in, in, in Mormonism and, and, and a strong love for Mormonism. Uh, did you see that in your life? Were you part of that as that was happening? Or? Well, it came up. I mean, it's a good question. Right. Um, like we were inactive as uh, you know his children, we were inactive at that point. But um, you know, as his children, we we were aware of broad strokes of of, mm -hmm. of um, well, certainly his communication, of course, was um, big news in our family, and and we were all very concerned um, about how that was impacting him personally and and emotionally. It was really painful, and so we saw that, and he did share that with us. Um, as far as um, you know, being pursued by the church, I mean, he would tell us some stories here and there, um, some tidbits here and there, you know, over the years, you know, from this time. Um, um, so we, we we would hear these anecdotally, um, kind of just like in in passing, in a sense. Um, and he would share them with us mainly as like, I mean, as they came up, as I recall, it was sort of like you know maybe an amusing thing to to be able to share with us. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it was in the moment. I don't think he was telling us these things as they were happening yes. in the moment. I mean, this is a few later. years later, or maybe several years later, that we would be hearing these stories. So at the time, like say in, in, in 1988, 1989, I mean, at that point, myself, my brother, and my mom, we'd moved to Montana. Mm -hmm. um, and he was in, in New Orleans, uh, you know, for, for uh, several years. So there were stories that we would hear um, a little after the fact. Yeah. And they were, you know, more, at that point, there was some, some distance, and he would be able to share some amusing anecdotes with us um, a little bit after the fact, but in the moment, he was not sharing the the blow by blow, you know, at that time. And also, there was this physical distance, and you know, he was checking in, you know, writing letters, calling at, at you know birthdays. He'd fly up to Montana to be with us cell phones, at Christmas. Yeah, you yeah. have to do yeah. that. Like, yeah, exactly. You had to make a long Good point. Call, Good point. Which was like expensive. Yeah. No, no FaceTime. Where you're like, yeah. oh, I said yeah. so. So yeah, we were in touch, like in that kind of um, in that way. You know, not um, you know not every day, um, like it's so easy to do today, and. Um, yeah, I mean, I was in middle school and I was like doing my thing and you know, our mom was there with us, she was raising us. So yeah. there was a sense of, of his, him being in a different place. And, you know, emotionally and personally, he, he was in a different place. Mm -hmm. um, while he was also, you know, um, scheduling time to be with us, mm -hmm. but it was maybe like once or twice a year. While he was living in New Orleans, certainly, and while we were in Montana, mm -hmm. it was once or twice a year. Um, and then, you know, long distance phone calls. And at that time, he was kind of stepping away from his Mormonism and more embracing his sexuality right, as yeah. he as he left. He went to yeah. LA and then he went on to uh, New, Orleans New Orleans and and was doing that, so. Yeah, and thank God, well, I'm, I'm glad and, that he did that. Right, no, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. saved a lot from yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and I would say he, he still, so he finally acknowledged that he could be a believing Mormon, mm -hmm. which he was till his mm -hmm. death. He believed in Mormon truth claims and be gay. Mm -hmm. And he finally says, when he comes out, he says, I know God loves me just the way I am. This is not a weakness of the flesh oh. as I've been taught, or this is not something yeah. I need to overcome. This is who I am and God loves me as I am. So he finally in later is like embraces both of those identities and realizes they both can be in him, you know, he, he comes to accept that and he knows that and he expresses that beautifully, I think. And he does, and, and that's that's absolutely true. And then something that I could I could add to that just, just comes up for me, I'm thinking about it is, 
is uh, his his continued um, solitude. Um, he he never was. I mean, as far as we really know, never like really in a uh, a solid partnership mm -hmm. um, and as a gay yeah. man. Long term. I mean, the, the only thing I'm really aware of that was somewhat long term was like a six month relationship in the late 80s. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and and years later, he would refer to that as like his his like his his one kind of like real relationship. Mm -hmm. And and this was this was you know a couple of decades later that he was talking about that relationship as being the closest that he got mm -hmm. to a an enduring relationship. Mm -hmm. And so he did accept that and he resolved that as Barbara um, just described really, really well. And at the same time, he would share, cause I would inquire about it. It's like, hey dad, so what is going on with, mm -hmm. with this with you? And and what is that story? And and he said, well, you know, Moshe, I mean, he, this is maybe in the early aughts that he basically um, shared this kind of point blank uh, characterization as, you know, I, I just spent a, a lifetime of, of denying, you know, a, a very mm -hmm. core part of myself yeah such that it, it, it's kind of an ingrained habit. And I just have like the, this, this lifetime of this, this behavior and this deep psychology that, that um, it seems I can't overcome. You know, denying this part of myself is something that maybe I can't quite ever get past yeah. you know, in a deep psychology kind of way. And that's just, I mean, I, I feel like tear, tear up a little bit just yeah. Yeah. recounting this because yeah. it's a yeah. horrible thing to, no, it... to, to hear from your dad that he, yeah. he kind of like uh, was resigned at that yeah. point that it wasn't going to um, work out for him to to find that life partner even yeah. though you know as the book you know he does express this he still harbored hopes the he last did. paragraph yeah. he, he's yeah. still hoping that someday he, he'll find someone the last he, paragraph he he yeah, yeah he he does and in some way he carries some some hope yeah. despite in some real ways uh, being resigned at the same yeah. time and i would agree just from not knowing my like michael did but just reading his words he expresses that beautifully and it is sad i teared up many times um <laughs> where he says, I've, I've been suppressing that part of myself since I was a teenager. So I, I don't know how to kind of let that out because he'd suppressed it for so long in his life was how he felt. So. And he tried. <laughs> he tried. He did try, he tried. Um, but, but it was a hard thing to, yeah, hard thing to figure I, out. I think even just arriving at where he did arrive, reconciling it to be able to say, I'm this and this is incredible for the era that he was oh, yeah. accomplishing this well, in. Yeah. Given where it's he so started, different. how he started. That's what I'm saying, from. so different. I wonder, yeah. what do you think he would think of? Are there strides being made? Are people in the same box now? Do you think he would feel there's some progress in Mormonism? I mean, I don't know. I guess you can look at it different ways. It's interesting. But yeah, for his era, I think that's incredible what, what he did and how he was just true to himself. He knew who he was, you know? And that comes through in everything that he did. Absolutely. I wonder if I could read um, something yes. that Troy Williams, who was the executive director of Equality Utah, he looked up to Mike, was a huge admirer of him. And so when he heard there was one last book coming forth Aww. from Mike after he died, even he was so excited. Um, and he wrote uh, in the, on the back of the book here, he said, Quinn was driven to reconcile contradictions in Mormon history as he privately struggled to reconcile the conflict between his deep spirituality and equally profound desire for men. Chosen Path illuminates the challenging journey many LGBTQ Latter-day Saints travel, and Troy is, an, is a mm -hmm. gay Latter-day Saint, mm -hmm. including the courage to ask dangerous questions that can lead to crushing heartache, but also triumphant self-discovery. And I just think that's there so beautifully said yeah. by Troy. That's exactly right. I, I wanted to ask one last question. Um, in, in the last paragraph of your, of your foreword, you say, I returned to the story in the 1988 autobiography that stayed with me most then as it does now. The choice his 12-year-old self made between being gay and being Mormon. There's a crushing pathos there. It set him up for a life of great hopes and of tremendous anguish. A life of inner struggles and pain, which I could see only from the distance he allowed as a protective, emotionally reticent father. There at the age of 12, myself, I knew he didn't have to make this decision. He could have both. He could be both. It seemed tragic, frustratingly tragic for all its needlessness. What, what do you mean by that uh, when you say he could have both? Do, do you feel that he could? Do you think, I, I know so a lot I'm of people not, today I'm would say- I'm not making a cultural or historical both. claim there. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm making, um, you know, a, a claim from my, from my emotional perspective. Yes. Um, as a 12 year old, when I, when I read that version of his autobiography, um, that's how it seemed to me. Um, that it's like, well, what is, 
what is what is this choice and, and why are you choosing between these two things why do um, you have to exactly. yeah why, why, you why have do you have to yeah and so i was um i felt very strong that there was no need you know it's of course it's a, a naive point of view but in a way i still believe that there's a there's some validity <laughs> to that point of view it's like why why is there a need to choose yeah. um you shouldn't have to is it naive or is it profound Oh, I mean both. I think it's both. <laughs> it is both. It is both. Uh, yeah, sure. It's, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> it's as complicated as his life. It's just, <laughs> just as complicated. Yeah, and, and that's right. how I felt. I mean, at that point, like he, um, I mean, he hadn't he hadn't been excommunicated, but I was, you know, I was I was I was aware. Like when he came out to us, I was ten. Mm -hmm. So then, two years later, I'm reading this version of, of his autobiography, and so I had at that time. A really strong and also I mean him being forced to resign from BYU so mm. there was this feeling that I had and it was really shared across our family of like the church really just like did him dirty yeah. and he got shafted yeah. um, and, and there was a, a sense of, of um, bitterness and resentment that I remember holding and harboring um, you know being his son and um, seeing his struggles and and his pain um, as caused by a lot of things coming from the church, um, rejection from the church, judgment from the church, leadership, you know, not, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. the entire, not the, yes. not a, right. it's not yeah. monolithic, you know, yeah. but, yeah. but you know, leadership and, and yeah. um, the hierarchy. And and so when I was reading this autobiography about him choosing to um, pursue this, this path of faithfulness and, and commitment to the church and denying this very natural part of who he was, simply just his identity and his being, it just seemed ridiculous to me and, mm -hmm. and unacceptable. Right. And so there was a sense of um, a kind of like righteous um, indignation that I was feeling at that time. I was like, this, this, no, <laughs> yeah. this is not right, you know, yeah. to, to have to choose. Yeah. So that's and what I was cool. speaking to here. Yeah. And I think it's fascinating that the, the title Chosen Path was the title your dad chose. We didn't pick that title for mm. the book. He gave this manuscript that title. So mm. it was it was his choice. Anyways, and, and the, the theme of paths and choosing paths comes out again and again in the book. So it's a perfect title for it. And then maybe we could also talk about the photo. I was just going to say the cover. that. That's right. The, why don't you tell us about how special this photo is and how you chose well, it? And yes. <laughs> well, I, I can't remember why, but Moshe shared with me. I found out Moshe was a photographer. Mm -hmm. that you do photography. Very talented. Like your, and you taught your dad or you did that with your dad? It was a hobby you no, shared? it was sort of a coincidence. Coincidence. I mean, in a way, like there's certain things that I pursued that I don't remember any influence coming from him. Oh, really? Uh, that he had done like earlier. Coincidentally, you were doing Well, it. yeah, I mean, so maybe it's a coincidence or maybe, you know, some line of influence was there, you know, that I'm not so aware of. But <laughs> yeah, he, he was a, a portrait photographer as like a serious hobbyist yeah. in the 80s. I don't know when he started exactly, but he, he, he was doing it through the late eighties into the nineties from yeah. what I saw. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was in his studio a little bit, um, on center street, is that center street where he lived for a couple of years oh, uh -huh. and Salt like he had a, just a studio in, in his apartment. Um, and then later, much later, I was not really focusing on photography at all. Um, until, um, I guess it was really my early twenties, um, that I just picked it up and I'm more of a landscape photographer and he was, you know, more of a portrait photographer. But yeah, you were saying so, that. So anyway, so I asked Moshe when I found out he was a photographer, I said, can you share some of your work with us? And maybe there's something that could work as a, a cover photo. I thought, how neat to, and I'm sure Mike would be thrilled to know his yeah. son took the yeah. cover photo. Oh, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. we looked at these and they were called Looking West, if I remember correctly. Yeah, the series, the series is, I call Looking West. Yeah. Um, and they yeah. were all of these beach photos of Northern California near Moshe's home. And then there was one, I said, I looked at it and I saw these footsteps and there were two paths, like two choices. And I showed it to our designer. I said, could we make that work with these paths? And he said, yeah, I think we can do something with that. And, and then Jason Francis, our brilliant designer came up with this cover design, but it comes from Moshe. <laughs> well, yeah, and I want to, I mean, I want to just really acknowledge Barbara because it was really just, it was all coming from her. You know, it was her, her vision and her initiative to like say, hey, you know, so most, Michael's son, it's photography, and, Moshe as and much as bringing right. this into yeah. it, and mm -hmm. I, I know that my father would would be deeply moved and oh. deely touched, and and I, you know, want to acknowledge and, you know, express my gratitude to you, you know, for that oh. vision. Thank and, you uh, for sharing interest. it. Yeah. yeah, and then we also know we we were just talking about this, but Michael loved the beach. You know, he grew yeah. up in the LA area, yeah. and one of the first photos we have in here is 
of him with his parents as a very young boy standing on the beach. And oh. so just kind of that beach theme seemed perfect too. So. Yeah, and of course, um, Moshe wrote a beautiful foreword to this book, which you've, yeah. you've already read yeah. from, which is, is, is really wonderful to have. Yeah, it, it's a beautiful book inside and out. I just, I can't wait for this to really get out there and to, I know that you guys will be talking to more podcasts and more people and just, I can't wait to see the response. Why don't you tell us as we're ending, Barbara, how can people get a hold of this book? I know sure. there's some different places and different so ways. Right, right now it's available in Kindle on okay. Amazon. So you could, anyone can go um, and just, it's only $9.99. Okay. <laughs> Grab a copy immediately and start reading. If you'd like a hard copy, we anticipate it will be in bookstores in January. So very soon and available to buy the print version on Amazon very soon as well. So please be watching for it. Yes. But, um, and then hopefully we'll have Moshe come back out to Utah to visit and we'll do some book signings. So yep. he'll be available to sign the book as well. We will keep you posted. Yeah. Um, if you uh, visit signaturebooks.com, we have an events page and we'll be sharing information about future signings there oh. as well. Yeah, I have no doubt that there's going to be a lot of demand and they're going to want you back to talk about this. So this is no, great. It was a pleasure to talk to you. I know. Yeah, just oh, so it's... much insight. I you know. Such a nice young man. You just, yeah, yeah just <laughs> got him to get to know you. <laughs> compared to us, they're the they're the fact checkers for this podcast, <laughs> yes. I suppose. Ah, <laughs> uh, you heard it here, that's we're, right. We're, the three of us, we're all the same age. That's, that's right. right. I so know. You, you're you're right. a young kid. Yeah, you're the kid, the kid at the table. So, no, this just has been delightful. It's just been incredible. And I was just sitting here thinking we have this space here, but I kind of feel like maybe your dad checked in now and then during the <laughs> podcast. You know what I mean? I mean, just as we play pay tribute and learn more about his life. That's right, right here. I kind of feel like you it. know what. What is kind of neat is is Mike talks a lot about his favorite songs in this book, and he closes the literally the last paragraph he wrote. And I think maybe he intended to maybe write more later, but he never did because he passed away. But the very last paragraph he talks about a favorite song. And so people can go, what I would do is I would go to Spotify and play all the songs he was talking about starting in the 60s when oh. he was a teenager in some really bad songs in the 60s. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. He oh, talked about his Iron Maiden concert. Oh, that's the 80s. Yeah, it gets better good. in the 80s and 90s. But anyways, you can like go and listen to these songs that oh, he talks about. What his favorite. And listen to the ones that he wrote. And that's what I do. And I listen to these songs that he talks about. What his favorite. And listen to the words and hear Michael speaking through right. those words. Too. Well, and also, I mean, just to briefly add, like he was a real movie buff. And that's yeah, just something that I always... Carry and, and cherish and remember, you know, um, that he gave me this love of cinema. And there's a lot of, um, you know, if anyone's interested in cinema and movies, there's a lot, um, almost like a like an autobiography of of his life, kind of like told through movies that through he movies, was yeah. moved by and interested oh. in, and that 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 impacted him at certain times of his yeah, life. Yeah, movies come out throughout the book. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. it's an interesting oh, strand of many many strands. But there are a ton of playlist. strands in this yes. book. You can go <laughs> yeah. anywhere. Yeah, there's yeah. just so many. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, thank you everybody for making time for this. This is just amazing. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And, and I hope we were able to sort of convey how much we appreciate and love this book and appreciate those that brought it together. I think in just an inspired collaboration. It, it's just amazing. And I'm really excited to um, hear all of your reactions. Please comment, let us know. Did you run right out like Barbara said and get the Kindle version and have <laughs> you read this? Because we want to know what you think. So. Um, please like and subscribe to Mormonish. And if you'd like to be made aware of when our new episodes come out, you can hit the notification bell and it'll let you know. Also, if you'd like to financially support Mormonish podcasts, we always have links in the show notes um, to Venmo and to PayPal. And we certainly appreciate all of you that do support us. We just, we really, really appreciate everything that you do for us. And we will sign off again tonight. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Moshe. Thank you, Landon. And thanks again for Mormonish podcast. Bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.